Alright, coming in at number 10, we have the homunculus theory from Cars. Sure. I actually wasn't ready for this. Like, why, why, why do theorizey people with their brains need to go around making disturbing theories? Why can't they just enjoy movies? Why? So, Disney Pixar's Cars is a great film. I love it. It's set in an alternate kind of universe where humans don't exist or they don't seem to. Maybe they did one day in the past, but they aren't around anymore. We never meet a human. The only sentient beings seem to be the cars themselves. And boats. I did see some boats. But mainly, it's cars. Hooray for cars. Cars as far as the eye can see. Cool. Weird, but you know, it's a movie, so let's just let it go. Which is what some people should have done. Unfortunately, though, some people pointed out that if this is the case, if there are no humans around, then why do the cars have windows, door handles, mirrors, and a steering wheel? These are functions made for humans. Well, the theory goes that humans are actually living inside the cars, and the car outer shell is like a strange exoskeleton. Do you remember the tiny alien in the person's head in Men in Black? It's a bit like that, but creepier. Someone has drawn a physiological diagram of what this would look like, and honestly, I don't like it. You can read pages and pages and pages of theory, and honestly, we don't have time for the disturbing ins and outs, but I'll leave you with this. In the theory, they say that humans are lab grown in amniotic vats and then embedded within an automotive exoskeleton. Coming in at number nine, Carl was dead all along in Up. There is one super sad and morbid theory out there that goes that Carl, the lovely grumpy old man, died the night after the courts tell him he has to leave his home in his sleep. Everything else is said to be his adventure to heaven to be with his dead wife, Ellie. Russell is said to be his guardian angel. Angel, but an angel in practice who needs to earn his wings. In the movie, he needs a badge for assisting the elderly to become a senior wilderness explorer. Now, the theory says that Carl's guardian angel is a child because he and Ellie were never able to have one. So sad. The house that Carl and Russell fly away in is said to represent Carl's physical attachment to the present world, and floating up is said to represent his transformation from the real world to the spirit world. Paradise Falls in the movie is said to be the gates of heaven, which Carl eventually reaches. Was he dead this whole time? It seems the theory started on Reddit and ballooned from there. Pardon the pun, I'm honestly just trying to quell my pain with humor. Coming in at number eight, Boo grows up to be a witch. This is a Monsters Inc. and Brave collaboration theory. Right, so this one involves time travel and a bit of a stretch of the imagination, but bear with me. So basically I never thought that cute little Boo would turn out to be the witch in Brave. Like what? It seems that there is an easter egg in Brave that has got people cooking up a terrifying theory. It seems that there's a wood carving of a monster that looks a lot like Sully in the witch's cabin. Boo and the witch do after all have the same colour eyes. So basically the theory goes that Boo spent her life looking for Sully, which led her to go through through many, many doors, a la Monsters Inc. In the end, one door took her to the past, and she learned to time travel. Remember the scene in Brave when the witch goes through a door and disappears? Is it Boo? She'd know how to do this. There are further suggestions that the witch has seen the future. She carves a pizza van from wood. Again, she carves the Sully. Maybe she's looking for him, allegedly. Honestly, I can't fathom Sweet Boo being a baddie, but good theory. Coming into number seven, we have another Monsters Inc. theory. This one is like a collaboration with Monsters Inc. and Toy Toy Story is Randall, Andy's monster. In the first and second Toy Story movies, Andy is the perfect age for a monster. In Monsters Inc, monsters go around scaring kids just like Andy to help generate power. Now we know that Disney and Pixar love a good easter egg, and if you look closely, it seems they may have dropped a hint about what goes bump in the night in Andy's room while his toys are sleeping, or motionless. This theory was pointed out by the Super Carlin brothers, who I absolutely love. Have a look at this. Now, this does look a lot like Andy's famous cloud wallpaper, does it not? Also, is this Andy's door in the door lineup? Randall may have been Andy's monster all along. Ugh. Randall. Coming into number six, Andy's dad was murdered, another Toy Story theory. So we've had a bit of news about this from the Disney Pixar camp, but before we talk about what may have been confirmed or denied, I want to talk about this worrying theory. It seems that a fan of the franchise on Reddit posted that they thought Andy's dad, who we never meet, is dead. It wouldn't be surprising, would it, knowing that Disney is basically the parent killers of the ages. Like, dead, dead, dead. Always dead. At least one parent dead, anyway. So the theory goes that Andy's dad was a police officer, but 
but he was shot and killed on duty, hence Andy's obsession with male authority figures. We see Andy and his family move home, maybe this is because of his dad's death. Another theory says that he died from polio, but Toy Story creator Andrew Stanton wrote that this was actually complete and utter fake news. What is going on with his dad then? Tell us Andy, Andrew, Stanton. Coming into number 5, Wally is actually evil. I actually honestly refuse to believe this one. This is pretty long and it's like quite intense to go into. I just don't want to believe it as well because Wally is so cute. Nonetheless, a number of fans out there have pointed out that it is almost impossible for the Earth to become overrun by trash by accident. Some fans say that the Wally unit went rogue and destroyed all of the other Wally units over a 700 year murder spree. Apparently, this is why there is so much waste. There's only one robot around, and we see him cannibalizing parts of his fellow units at the beginning of the movie. Wally can't be a murderer, can he? Coming in at number four, Toy Story is an allegory for the Holocaust. Dustin Hoffman of UGO actually drew some pretty convincing parallels between the Holocaust and Toy Story 3. They argue that the toys are a symbol of the Jewish people who were left behind by the Allies in World War II. The toys, as you will remember, try to seek refuge in the attic, striking a reference to Anne Frank. In the end, they are offloaded to the Sunnyside Daycare Center, which turns out to be a lot like a prison or a concentration camp. There's then the whole incinerator scene which Hoffman links to the final solution and the death camps. Pretty heavy and terrifying stuff. In the end, the toys are saved by well doing aliens. Now, a lot of Jews were actually freed from concentration camps at the end of the war, although, of course, six million weren't. Some fans who have jumped on the Toy Story Holocaust bandwagon have gone as far as to say that. Actually, the toys did die in the incinerator, and the alien rescue is actually their journey to the afterlife. What about Toy Story 4 then? I don't know. Coming into number three, Nemo from Finding Nemo is dead. Hmm. In a Sixth Sense style plot twist, some people think that Nemo is dead. Now, according to a popular internet theory, Nemo also died when his mum was killed in the shark attack at the beginning. Basically, Nemo's mum and all of their eggs were killed at the very beginning of the movie, except for one. Nemo. Basically, though, the theory says that it was all in Marlin's head, and in an attempt to cope with the tragedy, he imagined one of the eggs was left. Now he dreams up Nemo, a dependent fish who, in theory, would never leave him, but it all goes wrong. Such are the lows of depression. In the end, Marlin accepts his grief. Apparently, Nemo means nothing in Latin, and some theorists basically went from there. We have another Finding Nemo theory up next. This one is actually even more horrifying. So, kids, please close your ears for the love of all things. Holy. Coming into number two, Nemo would have had sex with his. Actually, do you know what? I just can't say it. I'm not gonna say it. I won't. So basically, this is both a theory and a biological fact. Nemo is a clownfish. All clownfish are born as hermaphrodites with both sexual organs. They develop into male or females depending on their social experience. And in the clownfish world, females are dominant. Who run the world? Female clownfish, that's who. But basically, they can also change sex when need be. It seems if Nemo's mum had died, Marlin, his dad, would have turned into a female to become more dominant and protect his offspring. Then his dad turned mum and Nemo would have mated because fish don't understand incest. Then if Nemo's dad slash mum had died, Nemo would have changed into a female and mated with another male. Cool. Sometimes science is scarier than a horror movie. Finally, coming into number one, we have the dead friends theory. There is a lot of Toy Story in this list, but let's face it, Toy Story is the most popular Pixar creation and there are three of the movies soon to be four. So as we know in the world of Toy Story, toys drop down motionless when humans come into a room. Humans play with the toys and the toys pretend not to be sentient. Well, have you ever thought about this? Illumise wrote on Tumblr, if the toys in Toy Story died, the kids would keep playing with them like normal, but the other toys would be playing with their dead friends. What the hell? Honestly, what the hell indeed? My question is though, can toys in Toy Story die? Like if they're dropped from a great height? with that killer toy? Like probably not, so unless they're burnt like they almost were, how can they die anyway? Although I think back and I remember the mutant toys, like I guess that's pretty messed up. Sid was a horrible, horrible kid. They're kind of like living corpses, a bit human centipede but in Toy Story, this is so dark and none of them can speak. So dark. Honestly, Pixar, you've done it again. The Babadook is from Monsters Inc. So we know that in Monsters Inc., monsters harness the screams of children to create power. Well, there's a theory out there on the internet that the Babadook is a monster from the Monsters verse. To be honest, Sam's screams could power a city. In 
in the Babadook book, the monster comes from a closet, which is classic Monsters Inc. behaviour. Does Sam have his own door, and is the Babadook his monster? Is it a working monster like the rest of them, clocking in as 9 to 5? Then I have to say, maybe the gay icon Babadook with the smile and the colourful hat and sunglasses, maybe he could be the laughter era monster. See? It makes so much sense. Coming in at number 9, we have a huge aviation disaster and Edna Mode's death plot from The Incredibles. So Edna Mode is the woman who makes the superhero suits in The Incredibles, and if you remember correctly, she was very anti cape. Dyna guy. Oh, he had a great look. Oh, the cape and the boots. No capes. Who can even blame her as well? We did learn that the superhero Strato Gale died when her cape got sucked into a jet engine. This means that she also likely took the plane down with her too. A bird in the engine can do this to a plane, so a human, well, that's nasty. It is thought that the accident took place in 1989, forcing superheroes into hiding for 15 years until the film's release in 2004. So, the plane does look a bit like a United Airlines plane. We suspect that the incident happened in America. Could this plane crash have been the real cause behind the Denver to Chicago Flight 232 crash? Some people on the internet certainly think so. In that crash, 111 people died and 185 people survived. Beyond that, it gets even darker. It is thought that actually a cape was included on the villain of the movie specifically so he would meet the same fate. What about the people on the planes though? What about them? Coming into number 8, did Andy's mum abandon Jesse? This one has done a few rounds across the internet, and it seems that Andy's mum, the sole parent in his life, may have been a callous toy abandoner. We know that Jesse was devastated when her previous owner Emily grew up and left her. Clues lie in Andy's hat, which looks way more like Jesse's. Could it have been a hand down from his mum? His mum also mentions Woody is an old family toy, a collector's item from the 1950s, so maybe her parents. Meh. When we see Emily's room, it looks like Jessie and Emily were together in the 60s or 70s, making Andy's mum the right age to have been playing with toys, assuming she's in her early to mid 30s when the first Toy Story came out in the late 90s. In the box that Jessie is bundled into, we see other cowgirl paraphernalia, but the hat isn't there. Was the hat handed down to Andy? It certainly looks like it. Also, look at this shot of Emily as a teen. Could this be Andy's mum? It could be. Coming into number seven, Riley's parents aren't okay in Inside Out. Well, that's pretty worrying, isn't it? During Disney Pixar's Inside Out, we get to see inside people's brains, and I kind of like that. Not only do we see inside Riley's brain, we also get a little glimpse at other people, specifically her mum and her dad. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that when we peek into her mum's brain, we see that sadness is the leading emotion running the show, and that in her dad's brain, the alpha emotion is anger. So, her dad is angry and her mum is sad, that's pretty depressing, isn't it? We also hear his angry brain refer to her as simply woman, which he says in a derogatory way. What? What is it, woman? What? It doesn't actually really seem like from this quick snapshot that they're a very happy couple. There are other theories out there that Riley is adopted, but that isn't particularly dark or scary, so we'll leave that out for now. Coming into number six, the bad guys are helping each other in Ratatouille and Up. Ratatouille is one of my favourite Pixar movies, especially because I love food and a cooking rat is hilarious. I also loved Up, although I am not down with the character of Charles Muntz. He learned that dogs are sentient and he basically then ends up abusing them as slaves. How did Muntz even find out that animals can communicate and work with humans? Well, some people think that he was in cahoots with the villain of Ratatouille, Chef Skinner. So Remy the Rat works with Linguini to create beautiful food, but when Chef Skinner finds out that Remy can cook, he tries to capture him and put him to work on a soulless frozen fast food project. In the end, Chef Skinner gets away, and the theory goes that Skinner flees France and heads to South America, where he met the villain Muntz and told him the animal's secret. With that information, Muntz is able to develop his collars. Also, does this snap from Ratatouille foreshadow it all? Possibly. Coming into number five, Toy Story is promoting the Illuminati. Ah, there's nothing like a mid list top 10 appearance of the Illuminati. It's classic, it's a tailor's oldest time. This honestly is a bit of a stretch for me, but some people are convinced that Toy Story has hidden Illuminati themes. I don't know though. There are straws to be clutched, and people are gonna clutch them. People are pointing out stars on the wall of Andy's bedroom. Stars, of course, are made of triangles, and triangles are, of course, the ultimate symbol of the Illuminati. Also, inverted pentacles are a thing, and they're 
spotted in a toy store. There also seems to be a sun pyramid on display. Lotso also references pyramids and Mrs Potato Head has just one eye. Honestly I do think this theory is ridiculous and I don't believe that Toy Story is controlled by a murderous and elusive secret order, but maybe I'm a skeptic. After all, what was happening at Walt Disney's Club 33? Coming into number 4, Andy has no friends and maybe he's a clone. There is something weird going on with Andy. Have a look at him. Here he is. We know that he loves playing with his toys, but does he actually have any friends? Sure, we meet them, right? But do we? There's a scene in which Andy is seen hanging out with his lad mates. The only thing is, they all have the same face. Andy's face. Even Sid looks a lot like Andy, just with different colour eyes. When Andy grows up, he looks a little different, but the theory goes that as a kid, he didn't actually have any friends. He invented them in his mind. That or he's a clone. Some people even think that Sid and Andy are related. Ok, listen, I don't like saying this as much as you guys aren't gonna like hearing it, but there are some darker sides to Toy Story when you really think about it. Get ready because I'm only gonna say this once, coming in at number 3, the toys have all seen Andy masturbate. Good, great, can we move on now? No? Well basically all the toys likely witness Andy's transition from boy to teen and all of the dark stuff that involves. Why worry your webcam is watching you when you have a room filled with eyes watching you until you finally get rid of all of your toys? But I have to say, even people I knew at university had a teddy on their bed and that's pretty grim if you think that all toys are real and can see you. Stop watching me! Coming in at number 2, Sully was murdered and turned into a toilet seat cover. Ok so in one of our Disney scary theories we talked about how Zazu said to Mufasa that Scar would make an excellent throw rug and then he turned up in Hercules as, well, a rug. Well, we can write that one off as karma. Yes, I think that hunting sucks, but Scar was the literal worst. You know who wasn't the worst though? Who was arguably actually the best? Sully of Monsters Inc. It seems unfortunately though that the lovable monster may have met the same nasty fate. In one scene of Monsters Inc, Randall, the creepy monster, explains to Sully why he hates humans. He says, I've heard humans skin monsters and make toilet seat covers out of their fur. Sully's like, that's nonsense, and sure. Unfortunately though, in Pixar's short Partysaurus Rex, we see a very suspicious looking toilet seat cover. Like it can't be, can it? Are the things just like Randall said? Did Sully make a mistake in trusting humans? Is he now dead and all that's left of him is his fur? Say it isn't so. Finally coming in to number 1, this is a bit like pondering black holes in the wider universe, honestly I am mind boggled, we have the Pixar theory. So the Pixar theory is a consuming mind melt of a theory that all Pixar movies are related and exist along a timeline of a shared universe. A really messed up universe. There will never be enough time in any of our videos to tell you in depth how this works, but let me try and summarise for you. So it seems it all starts with Brave with the Will of the Wisps, aka magic. This magic interacts with animals, humans and objects. A time loop is created by a magic witch who disappears through a door. It later turns out in the theory that the witch is Boo from Monsters Inc. The timeline spans from the 14th century right up to the 50th century with Monsters Inc. At one point, animals rise up to try and overthrow humans, but machines help the humans win. But then the remaining humans were sent off into space on a ship called Axiom amid a worldwide takeover from an evil corporation BNL. It goes on, but it's a mind melt, and it's a terrifying glimpse of the future. Kicking things off just like that, in at number 10, Nemo is a figment of Marlin's imagination. Ok, wait, what? Ok, so you're telling me that my favourite fictional fish isn't even real? Well let's go back to the beginning of the movie when a scary barracuda attacked Marlin's clownfish family and knocked him unconscious. When Marlin woke up he imagined that one of his eggs survived when in reality they were all tragically eaten. And did you guys know that Nemo literally means no man or no one in Latin? Well I didn't know that either, I had to do a google search for that one, but I can literally feel a piece of my heart breaking and apparently this whole movie is Marlin journey through the five stages of grief. First we have denial, so when Marlin won't let Nemo go to school because it's not safe. Then we have anger, he yelled at Nemo for venturing off on his own. Next is bargaining, he puts up with Dory in hopes of finding his son. Despair, when Marlin saw his son getting flushed down the drain. And finally we have acceptance. We see this when Marlin learns to let go and let things be the way that they are. I mean wow, if I ever to rewatch this movie, I'm pretty sure we're all going to be pretty depressed. Toy Story 3 is an allegory for the holocaust and this takes us 
to number 9. This is pretty dark. To recap, Toy Story 3 was about Andy going off to college, so he had no use for his beloved toys. The intention was to put them in an attic, but somehow they actually ended up at the curb with the trash. When he saved the rest of the toys, but somehow in the process, he was donated to a daycare center. Alright, so back to this dark theory, apparently Toy Story 3 and the Holocaust have some underlining similarities. Well, hear me out. First, the toys wanted to hide in the attic, which is pretty similar to Anne Frank. Then they were shipped to a daycare, which is a place where they were concentrated and routinely mistreated by children instead of Nazis. And then we have the incinerator scene, which I don't even think I need to explain. I'm not going to go with that one because it's pretty horrifying and we're talking about a real life event that was dramatic. I mean, what were the writers thinking with this one? I don't know. Did we actually believe that no one would notice? Number eight, cars take place in the future where humans don't exist. So what happened to us? Well, apparently cars take place in a dystopian world where all of the humans have died. Is this the future of what Earth is gonna look like? You know how the Simpsons predicted a lot of stuff? Well, maybe Disney is right about this one as well. Haven't you ever wondered how these talking cars were even created? Well, according to this theory, humans have been creating smart cars that have the ability to drive themselves. Over the years, these cars got smarter and smarter until one day they said, you know what? We don't need humans anymore. They slow us down and they, they're just extra weight. So let's get rid of them. And that's exactly what they did in this theory. These cars went on a murderous rampage and wiped out our species. But apparently the cars take on the personality of the last person who drove it. So basically you're saying that these cars are metal ghosts of people's spirits and they're just trapped inside of these vehicles. I mean, things got super dark pretty quickly. Dopey and Geppetto are the same person and this takes us to number seven. This theory is pretty sad and disturbing at the same time. Well, let's compare Dopey and Geppetto side by side. Okay, apart from the large age gap and me almost not remembering who Geppetto was, I'm like, Geppetto, who is that? Well, it's easy to see that they have a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of personality traits in common as well. Both of them are kind, they're clumsy, easily confused, and they tend to get scared very easily. But let's dive a bit deeper, shall we? Let's say that originally that they were actually six dwarves. One day when they were out in the forest, they stumbled across an abandoned baby. They thought he was a dwarf, so they took him in. As time went on, the others started to tease and abuse him. At that time, Dopey would have been a toddler who couldn't speak yet. So that kind of explains why he's so clueless and quiet. But once the others realized that he wasn't a dwarf, they kicked him to the curb. But Dopey was in love with Snow White, even when he he got older so he made Pinocchio to be modeled after her. The puppet was supposed to represent what Dopey thought a child of theirs would look like. I mean, take a look at this picture. They actually look like they could be related. I feel really bad for Geppetto now. Number six, Snow White and Cocaine. Okay, that, well, you know what? I, I didn't mess up with this one because we have another Snow White theory on this list. By the way, have you guys tried to rewatch Snow White when you got older? Well, it's actually really painful. I don't know if I would highly recommend it, but I couldn't even make it past the part where she's singing into the well. But you know what, I wasn't a huge fan when I was a kid, so I guess I don't respect it now as an adult, but a lot of you guys probably love it. But anyways, getting back to the theory, the name Snow White is a metaphor for cocaine and happy, grumpy, sneezy, dopey. They represent side effects from snorting too much of it, too much cocaine. And then we have Doc. Doc, because if you are a cocaine user, it will most likely send you to a medical professional at some point. And don't even get me started on the haunted forest scene. That was a bad trip gone seriously wrong. And maybe she was singing into the well and hearing voices because she was flying high. It's all starting to make sense now, actually. Was this even a kid's movie? This should have been like 18A. 18A, is that even a such thing? I think it might be a Canadian thing. Carl was dead the entire time and this depressing theory takes us to number five. The movie up was already super sad as it was and pretty heartbreaking and now you're telling me that Carl was dead the entire time? Is this real life right now? First his wife Ellie suffers a miscarriage, then they're told that they can never have kids. So they try to save up money for a trip of a lifetime, but when Ellie got sick, she's hospitalized and then she died. 
Remind me why I ever wanted to watch this movie in the first place. But now this theory is telling us that Carl died in his sleep when he got the call telling him that he might be moving to a retirement home. Apparently the entire movie is about his journey to the afterlife and when the house rises up towards the sky, it's actually a metaphor for him going to heaven and Russell was his guardian angel. I'm literally so heartbroken right now, I don't even know what to do with myself. Shots fired in at number four with Gaston killing Bambi's mother. I warned you guys, I warned you that this list it wouldn't be easy to get through, but are any of you guys really surprised by this news? I don't, I don't think you guys are. I mean, Gaston was the real beast of the movie and he didn't really care about who he hurt. We all know that Gaston was a really good hunter because he had so many dead animals hanging on his wall. I mean, it, the evidence was there, it was pretty obvious. And in one of his songs, he sang that he uses ants and all of his decorating, which sounds super suspect to me. It's pretty suspicious. And let's not forget that at the very beginning of the film, we see a deer drinking from the river in front of a castle. Yeah, I realize that it can literally be any deer, but Disney loves throwing an Easter egg, so it was probably Bambi's mother right before Gasson murdered her. It's a theory that could be very plausible. Next up, number three, Sully was killed in Monsters, Inc. and was turned into a toilet seat cover. This movie is about a world full of monsters who earn a living by capturing children's screams, but in reality, the monsters are also terrified of humans. And it probably has something to do with Randall's theory that humans are known to kill and skin monsters and turn them into toilet seat covers. So if you were to watch one of the Toy Story's animated shorts, Partysaurus Rex, the toilet seat cover in Bonnie's house, it looks super familiar. I mean, why would you do this to us, Pixar? And I guess this explains why Monsters University was a prequel instead of a sequel. Mike Sully wasn't alive to do the second movie. Peter Pan might be a pedophile and this brings us to number two. When we first think about Peter Pan, we see a highly spirited young boy who lives in a magical world called Neverland, where children never grow up. But enough of that fake betrayal. Let's expose Peter Pan for who he truly is. First of all, he enjoys stalking little girls. When Wendy helps Peter Pan with the shadow, he reveals to her that he already knows her name her family, where she lives, and what she does every day because he's been watching her from her window curtains for years. Is this real life right now? Wendy should have gone to a restraining order and called the police. But then we also learn that Peter Pan goes one step further and kidnaps little boys and girls. He uses Tinkerbell and forces her to use her powers to make the children learn how to fly so that they can be able to come to the magical world. But he forgets to mention that there are killer pirates there and he doesn't even get permission from their parents. All Peter Peter Pan is missing is a white van and a creepy mustache, but that might be part of the sequel. Topping off this disturbing list in at number one, we got Peter Pan again. Peter Pan is an angel of death, so if he's not a pedophile, he might be this. What's going on with Peter Pan? Why hasn't he been arrested yet? First he's kidnapping people and now he's the angel of death? Well, let me explain. Apparently Peter Pan is a deranged psychopath who kills lost boys when they become adults. This explains why kids never grow old in Neverland and maybe Captain Hook was one of the good guys after all. Some even say that Captain Hook used to be a lost boy, but he discovered what Peter Pan was up to so he was able to escape and made it his life mission to put an end to Peter Pan. Once he's done with the Lost Boys, he probably throws them in crocodile infested waters. Mm -hmm. 